the other year. There's a total disconnect now between the ruling group and the masses. I hate psychology. Clear out. They're the same worm. Light characters. Analysts. Fuck you with your stupid argument. They should not bother us. Democracy. All of this just works. Vote for the generation to come dynamic game engine. A millennial video SES. All the support, strength. Constant freedom. And a dance chain. I haven't yet. They are a disease of our time. Fear them now. You're voting for what your grandfather and father fought for. I sit and you. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Long House, the weekly show and gathering point for the sensible centrist. This week, we have a bit of a hodgepodge of things we want to cover. Um, it just so happened to be that uh, we, we sort of collected a bunch of things we wanted to talk about uh, that came up during the week, so figured it'd be nice to just get it out of the way. We can leave the more focused episodes for when the time comes. Ludic Path, welcome back. Thank you very much. Glad to be back as usual. Some funny topics we're going to dive into today. Yes. And I mean, usually we talk about, about the weather at the beginning, but I think we're going to skip that this week just to make sure that we have enough time to cover as much as possible. Uh, thank you, everyone who are joining us in the chat. Um, it's always nice to see you guys. And uh, We'll be keeping an eye on the chat, of course, as always, as we go on and bring up anything that might be relevant. So um, we'll start off with uh, some local news, quote unquote, from uh, Norway this week, um, where <clears throat> I guess I'll have to uh, start by explaining the concept of these like graduation parties, right? Logic path. Well, the, yeah, the graduate, the Rus parties in Norway, yes. have we, I think we've touched on them before and we've they are very them. particular. We're going to have a refresher to anyone who's, who's listening and who aren't from here. Uh, I'm not sure. I think Swedes have something similar, but maybe someone can follow up in the chat. Anyway, when you finish high school in Norway, uh, pretty much for the last month, uh, there is sort of ritual celebrations going on. You get these funny pants and hats and you basically drink yourself to death. Uh, and uh, uh, do various challenges in order to get like various baubles and, and you know fame and claim and, and all that stuff. Uh, and that can vary from you know minor just pranks to uh, sexual accomplishments, let's say. Uh, something that's grown uh, lately, I say lately, over the past maybe like 20 years, is the idea of people coming together. Uh, you know, friend groups or larger groups coming together of these graduates and basically buying a bus, usually a rundown bus, which they then sort of restore to a party mode. They'll fit kit it out with like speakers and, uh, you know, fridges for beer, etc. cetera. Uh, and they'll usually have it painted in like garish colors or, or following some kind of theme uh, that sort of they, they build this sort of like imagery around the group, right? Now, yes, um, I mean, just commenting on this, uh, it, it's been a bit of an issue and something that comes up in Norwegian media, whether it would, I, I mean, usually uh, from more of a leftist perspective, because as we're getting into now, like the, the general Scandinavian right will just never touch on actual cultural issues, right? Um, I had some, you know, I saw some dialogue on Twitter recently about like the popularization of lesbianism in the early 2000s and uh i mean I, I come back to this you know the uh 2000s cultural sewer episode that we did previously um i mean i feel like the the like rus culture it really has exemplified the kind of you know late 2000s cultural sewer escalation in ways that other things have not it's, it's a combination of that with the commercialization of um 
of the culture and like the general increase in Norwegian wealth, I think over time, mm. uh, particularly say from the nineties up until now has been, I mean, there's, it's been a really big increase in, in particularly in middle-class families. And you see it with the people who want to celebrate this Rus stuff, because like you said, they would just previously, they just buy used up cars or, it would have a bit of a kind of a lo-fi feel to it. You wouldn't use that much money, but there's yeah, you, you know, and your mates would fix up a car. Maybe like some of your guys' dad knew how to like you know fix oh, yeah. uh, fix the carburetor, right? And, and you'll get this thing running for a month, right? Uh, and, and and you'll you'll uh, you'll paint something funny on it, and you'll get you know get really drunk, and and then you'll trash it after that uh, month, pretty much, or try to pawn it off with someone. Who's, who's following you next year but this has become such uh, like a money drain for a lot of people and it, it's a very sort of a status signaling event as to, like if you want to be somebody in these sort of youth hierarchies you have to be in the coolest group it's it's similar almost to like these american sorority uh, uh, houses eternity yeah. houses almost at at this point because they these people are spending so much money they i mean some of them will start saving up in junior high school, uh, but like doing odd jobs and, and such in, in groups to, so they can buy more expensive cars. They, they're buying more expensive clothing, uh, equipment and so on. I mean, they really blow the budget on this stuff. Uh, you know, the, the trend lately, I, I mean, it's been a while since I did it, but the trend lately has been like people actually paying bands to write theme songs for their buses, right? So they'll have like yeah, maybe one days and yeah. to, have some kind of local artist blast music for them. I mean, you could imagine the price tag on these things and the amount of money that they blow on it. But it's, uh, I mean, I mean, it's it's a problem culturally because of the kind of escalation and excess, of, like you said, of the badge culture, where you you can get badges for doing kind of weird sexual things, and as well as the amount of money blown on it, the party scene that's come along with it, and how it's kind of because. I mean, you said it's only one month, but for a lot of these people, it, it tends to stretch out a bit. It, it'll they'll go for maybe three months, four months, you know, prior to this the end of the school year and continuing afterwards. So it's become an issue with people failing their exams because they're just kind of toked out of their head uh, twenty four seven, just doing these parties, and it's a bit too much of a distraction that doesn't really serve its purpose. So there's been sort of attempts culturally. With people trying to rein this in, but it's uh, it's very very popular. This is just to set some context for the uh, case that we're going to look at. I don't know if you have the article. I do have the article. The problem yeah. is that you know there are two things that YouTube doesn't like. Uh, one of them are interesting political opinions, and the other is uh, naked bodies. And unfortunately, this one <laughs> contains the latter. Uh, so it's going to be hard for me to show the offending bus in question. Um, but I can show a photo that's already sort of got this, um, got this, uh, uh, censored. So we'll, we'll start there and I'll, I'll walk you through sort of what has happened. Uh, so the way, and I'm just going to have to apologize. The only way I could find some of this that was already uh, censored was through like some web comic uh, with a guy with a you know funny flag in his uh, his uh, name, but here you can see down here is a widescreen shot of the bus, and of course in the middle there's drawn um, a woman uh, and a man engaging in intercourse, as it were, trying not to get uh, flagged by YouTube here. Uh, and I will translate the comic when we get on. Um, so what happened is that uh, some women's rights group basically got a hold of, of this bus and um, reported it to the police. And the police said, well, I mean, in legal terms, there's nothing wrong here. There's really nothing we can do. Um, and because it came to the police, the newspapers picked it up and then it sort of just blew up, right? Uh, because obviously this is shocking and it's, uh, uh, it's uh, <laughs> you know, it gets the clicks, so to speak. And there's been various back and forth, and uh, uh, I think even the prime minister got involved at some point, <laughs> having to comment on this, uh, uh, albeit briefly. Uh, the problem is that not really the bus itself 
uh, it's the discussion around it. And I've been um, exposed to a lot of people on right wing, uh, in the Norwegian right wing, um, on Twitter, etc., and you know other channels, saying a lot of stupid stuff, really. Um, and it's it's this classic sort of like being trapped by by the Overton window, like having to play the opposite of wherever your left wants. Would you agree with that, Lake Path? Yeah, it's a combination of the the red team, blue team uh, dynamics here, and also being trapped in the frame of counter jihad that we mentioned previously, right? Because this is a typical thing that you're seeing how like, uh, how it doesn't make sense. Um, they, you know, they talk about when you have these populist right types, they'll com complain about the alliances on the left, you know, but they say that, um, oh, oh, you're leftist, but you ally with someone who's from Palestine and they throw gaze of buildings and blah, blah, blah. But okay, uh, like where do they actually overlap logically? Well, like a Muslim would complain about this bus and uh, and the Norwegian feminist lefty would complain about this bus, whereas these kind of like counter jihad dipshits will just look at that stuff and just say that this is, this is we want uh, this is great, like thumbs up. This is freedom of speech. Yeah, we and, need more um, porn on the bus. We, yeah. we need just more public porn uh, running around. It's uh, <laughs> in typically in line with Norwegian Scandinavian tradition. Wholesome. Uh, I mean, porn is not a problem. This is the same thing we've talked about. Kent Anderson. I mean, he made some tweets to that effect because the Green Party had uh, one of their spokespeople pipe up about pornography they when they were talking about rapes right um in norway which of course i, I think is a sort of overblown topic but they they were talking about i don't remember who her, the name of the politician but she said that we need to have a conversation around pornography and then of course you get this kind of again populist right-wing dipshits coming out and saying that you know no it's it's all ahmed's fault and uh, pornography has it's just great uh it's right wing coded <laughs> we just you know it's yeah, everybody should just have access to porn all the time it's not something we should talk about it's it's really just about uh deporting the muslims and that's going to solve the other all thing of our is issues that, um, the other thing is that a lot of the people on the right seem to be saying that well and and this is what this web comic sort of uh shows as well um this is you know uh ostensibly some right-wingers yelling at some uh, rainbow flag people saying that, you know, stop uh, waving your sexual uh, activities uh, in our faces in public, uh, you're sexualizing children, etc. But meanwhile, this down here is just, you know, you, you this is just humor, it's just good fun, you know, boys are going to be boys. And just to be clear, I mean, Fubar in the chat, I can see, says you cannot fix this by attempting to neuter young men. And I don't think Letty or I, or none of us are trying to say that we should neuter the young men. I just think that, I'd like to think that we used to have a society in which, you know, the pride dildos being waved in your face and the porn buses weren't okay without you know, the society being any less sexual. There's something about public decencies that seems to have just, you know, gone out the window. Yes, I think that you should be allowed to enforce standards without that being some kind of infringement on the Faustian spirit. Uh, this does not seem to be two contradictory positions. I get some of these kind of Baptists uh, making this complaint that, you know, well, the uh, video game censorship is like trying to censor the uh, piratical young man spirit. Come on. <laughs> this is just about it's, like yeah. common standards and and i do, like, I, I do quite like, agree that yeah. you know video games as a vessel for for that is one of the few things in you know quote unquote game modernity we have but that still doesn't make it good <laughs> uh overall um so so what the a lot of the people on the right have been saying is that oh well but you know the left this is basically just the same as the left you know, waving pride dildos every June, right, uh, in front of kids. And I'm like, yeah, well, I don't want either. So can we do something about that? Yes, this, this is a sensible position. This is a completely non-contradictory position. I don't <laughs> want the pride dildos and the kind of like dog uh, submission suits. And I also do not want this uh, education, what do you call this, um, graduation celebration buses with pornography painted on them, running around honking their horns 14 hours a day. 
it, it does not seem to be an unreasonable position to make. I don't have to side with the Muslims or anything be, for yeah. that. Yeah. It shouldn't be. And I, I don't think it is. Like if you poll the population, I think you'll you'll find that, you know, it's probably like eight out of ten people would agree with us. Um so it's it's it just becomes very weird and online. And I made a tweet about this and I used um an image from uh uh, what's his name? The uh, the Limmy Show, the Brian Limmy Limmy Show, the uh, Scottish comedian, uh, where he's playing this like raving alcoholic, right? And and I basically had the tagline that the left want to remove the porn from the bus, and that's pretty much what the right looks like when you're just sort of screaming, <laughs> quote unquote, screaming that to random people. It, you just look insane, right? Yes, uh, this is a point that I've. I've said before, but the point of free speech is to be able to have difficult conversations politically. It's not to spread porn everywhere. This is something you should understand, right? It's not, uh, yeah, you just want to have like porn in everything and uh, just goon constantly in public. This is not the point. If this is the only use you have for free speech, then you might as well not have it. You know, we, we want to be able to talk about stuff like re-migration. That's, <laughs> that's the reason we need free speech. <laughs> It's not so you can yeah, watch more have the difficult yeah. conversations, right? Yes, exactly. Um, like guys like uh, you know Martin Sellner not being permitted to come into Germany because he's talking about re-migration of immigrants and how, who hasn't you know this man hasn't broken any laws, but just because you want to talk about that and you're being denied entry, that's the problem of free speech. It's not that you can't you know paint your your truck with uh, hardcore porn. Okay, uh, I don't think there's anything to say about that. It, in 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 that sense, it's been a weird week. Uh, looking at <laughs> looking at this from the sidelines and not really having a a dog in the fight, uh, other than feeling that you know both of these options are bad. I don't want any of this. Uh, so let's go on with this. Is slightly a bit of a continuation of something we uh, we talked about last week. Um, which was the young woman who uh, uh, in Denmark decided to become a single mother at 18 by um, artificial insemination. Um, and uh, this is not directly relevant, but I feel like it's it's sort of becoming a, a series and the, the newspaper here is being good and feeding me with content in that sense. This is an article about a Swedish journalist who's written a book about women without children or childless women, if you will. Um, first and foremost, to find out how she should think about herself or feel about herself. Uh, Leo Borealis has sent me an extremely schizo looking graph on, on element. Uh, maybe we'll look at that later. Um, Let's see here. So, Sarah Martinson wakes up in a hotel room. She's drunk and surrounded by empty champagne bottles, potato chip bags, wrapping paper, snuff boxes, and takeaway uh, boxes. It is the day after she turned 40. She quotes, I was 40, and I had no children. And I hadn't thought about, and I hadn't thought much about that question either. Now, I really had to just do that. Uh, just have a think about it. It is a question that will affect how my whole life will look uh, ahead. She says Sarah Martin's on on a video call from Södermalm in Stockholm. Now, I'm, you know, I don't want to be um, the old egg carton man here, but isn't 40, you know, a bit late to be? I, I know there's options these days, uh, but even even so, 40 seems to be a bit late to start <laughs> having having a thought about like what what do I want to do with my life. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit bizarre to get these people who's like, well, damn, I hadn't thought about this until now. I mean, really, uh, not once. I, I think you've lived more than longer than most people, like uh, in human history, <laughs> you know. And and you hadn't thought about this until now. You, you get to an almost like artificially high age um, for uh, for a woman. I don't know if it's um, the lack of mortality salience or um, all of the makeup that's kind of covering up the aging science Maybe. sometimes i worry about that you know uh, just as an aside the, we talked about mortality salience but there's something also to the fact just seeing yourself get older in the mirror you know if you have too much um 
you have too much makeup or you have you know too many modern comforts i think you miss out on that even though you, you are aging on total but there's just something You're about sort of i think fooling it, yourself and extending that yeah um, illusion too far and then you really hit the wall in a psychological oh, yeah. sense uh i mean it, it's been mentioned before that like uh, millennials you look younger i mean i know this isn't true for everybody but i read an article that i found from someone on twitter that they actually connected it to uh to hydration weirdly enough that in the 90s it became like a big thing to stay hydrated you know you've probably seen these uh, memes float around on social media the uh, stay hydrated my friends but right yeah. i mean when people say it i actually do remember this becoming a huge emphasis for people running around with plastic water bottles all the time and people do that you, now you they to... got the big big like uh, metal cups right yeah i mean you need to the, the idea that you need to uh drink two little liters of water for an adult person per day or if you don't do that you're not healthy i mean this is a very recent thing and i, I wasn't aware of it but people previously would not drink water i mean even through most of history you would drink uh, milk you would drink or something alcoholized beverage uh beers coffee something else but the idea of having like this level of hydration continuously it wasn't considered normal and uh it was also not expected that you would you know have to hydrate yourself a lot of people did just kind of drink coffee most of the time or um it's that story about um you know humphrey bogart i don't you know the uh, the actor he was uh, in africa filming to film a movie right and uh the entire film crew got malaria or some some sort of like stomach right. flu illness and he didn't and they just asked him like how he was able to stay healthy and like, he said that he, he only drank uh, whiskey <laughs> you know that's like <laughs> he he, 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 real yeah. yeah real men drink whiskey it's like he never drank water he, he just saw it as gay and uh, that was a lot more normal in the past but it would sort of explain if you look at people say from the 70s or 60s that they look slightly older simply because they i mean they weren't as fat for one and they were also a lot more dehydrated on average so it does create a bit more of that kind of crisp uh i don't know how how else you would say it crisp look <laughs> I, I think i, I think yeah. i get where you're going yeah just for the point of like informing people that you're you're in fact a little bit older than you look if you take away the, the all this baby fat from the, the water uh, weight from the taco the and all the water weight then uh, you actually do look a bit older than you think so this woman lives in a block full of single households and an acceptance of all kinds of ways of uh, all kinds of i guess uh, lifestyles her childlessness didn't need to be a big thing where she lives but it has become for her i felt quite gray I needed to ask myself once and for all if I want to be someone's mother. I needed to know who you become if you are a woman without children. So she writes in her book, Women Without Children, or maybe better translated, Childless Women, uh, uh, which recently was published in Sweden. Swedish journalist and author is now 42 years old, and she has gone to great lengths to find all the stories of those who do not, quote, follow the protocol, uh, the quote-unquote, deviant minority among women. Childless women uh, are uh, portrayed in such a stereotypical and black-and-white manner. While I felt quite grey, personally, I wanted to find the shades of grey, everything between the extremes, says Martinson. Either uh, you will get the story of the involuntary childless person who is mourning, or you will get the other extreme, women who are strong in their conviction about their, quote, freedom to have children. Sorry, what's this? Ah, freedom from children, she believes. What about all those who are not sure of their choices or wishes, or those who have perhaps waited too long without having time to take a stand? What, what do you mean, wait too long without having time to take a stand? You're 40 years old. Uh, okay, whatever. I was looking for a mirror, someone who looks like me. I wanted to see how women without children live their lives. Women who waver in their longing for children. She delved into all the literature, literature she could find about childless women, from historical accounts of witch burning of childless women, happiness research via Virginia Woolf, Simone de Beauvoir, and Norwegian writers such as Karin Haugen, researcher Christina Archetti, to the enormously growing group of mommy influencers on social media. I didn't want any conclusion 
but I felt that I didn't know what would happen to me. It is easy to find information on how to be a mother. My project is to describe uh, the non-being, I guess is, is the translation here. Sounds very Heideggerian in this translation. <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> We <laughs> we have limited we have limited language about the number and uh, limited number of available stories about this experience, says Martinson. She longed for a book that could sort of hold her hand and show and tell stories. Uh, so she wrote it herself. She has seen how women can falter in their longing for children. It is important to highlight that thoughts and wishes about children can change from one day to the next, from year to year throughout life. That's what I mean by shades of gray. Let's see here. The heteronormative 30s, in air quotes, flew by in Sarah Martinson's life without her being able to fully think about the idea of children. Uh, therefore, she experiences a wake-up call after the age of 40. Again, you're sort of, I mean... You're pushing it, right? <laughs> uh, it looks great, the gynecologist told her, uh, referring to her uterus, and both her ovaries are functioning as they should. That is not what is decisive for Martinson. By the way, um, Bloody Path, your father, so you've probably been sort of exposed to some of these statistics, uh, because I, I, I believe you do when you go through <laughs> uh, pregnancy, uh, of sort of like um, this diseases in children based on mother's ages and things like the chance for a child to be born with something like down syndrome uh, and how it just goes through the roof after like 35 <laughs> like it goes from like uh, a 0 0.001 percent to like a one percent <laughs> uh, after 35 it's it's actually quite insane um oh i have seen it yeah I yeah. do not like it. I wish I had seen it before, to be honest. Me too. I mean, it's uh, I mean, it's like this woman here who's like, well, I hadn't thought about it. Well, you know, you're starting to approach that age. And uh, damn, I, I wish I had at least that information I wish I had previously. You yeah. know? Uh, she feels that she is expected by society to long or regret, uh, but she wants to show that there are other lives to live. There are other other stories to tell. She perceives that society believes that the longing for children is something that you get sort of uh, affected by. It is a very interesting phenomenon, and it's seen as a given that the biological clock affects all women. But the longing for children is such a strong cultural na narrative that women do not who do not experience it feel that there is something wrong with them. This is Martin's son. Maybe she can relax when she turns 50. She's also believed that the longing for children would emerge just wait until you're 30, people around her would say. It's going to hit hard when you're 35. Sarah Martinson thought that the pressure from her surroundings would decrease or lessen after the age of 40. And then a friend told her that it actually eased after the age of 45. Now she's beginning to wonder if she will even be, be, even be able to relax at 50. <laughs> you're pushing it. I mean, 50 what is like sometime between 50 and 55, I'd say, is, is very normal. Uh, just look, just thinking about, you know, women in my life um, to sort of hit menopause, isn't it? Yes, I think so. I mean, but even before that, I mean, if you're you could you're, hit in, it your, in your that, 40s, yeah. you're sort of even like, even if the ovary looks yeah. nice, I think it's it's very unlikely that you're going to succeed in a, a natural pregnancy. Um, if you've, especially if you've never had any kids prior uh i think it seems to uh, just based on first-hand experience with like women who've had children previously it seems to be easier to get pregnant again uh, but i don't have any i don't have any data for it right the fertility industry has taken leaps and bounds in recent years ivf surrogacy sperm donor clinics has even artificial wombs in development development baby machines as she calls it is meant that even more women have become mothers or can be potentially become mothers and that it will be even stranger not to have children because it's so much easier than before oh my god could you i actually see it now like the idea that you know children are actually or like childbirth is just going to become a social construct like motherhood is just something that is forced on women mm -hmm. They're going to like will it into existence through technology basically <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
Well, Martin Zahn, the children, the question about children has been a lot about belonging, uh, a fear of being different and on the outside. She will refer to films and series where the goal of a happy ending moved away from romantic love and straight to the ovaries. Relationships would be fleeting, uh, are fleeting. Divorce is common. A child is something quite final, she describes. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'm not quite sure what she's saying here. Women without children is not selling. There's no... There's nothing about a nun mother that institutionalizes envy. Ah, okay. So people don't envy the the, the childless woman. That's it. Yeah, I think That's it's. Uh, I mean, it, we talked about you know hitting the wall and uh, these kind of like standard red pill talking points. But I mean, there's something else to. There's a, there's like a double layer for that when like a woman gets older that you can you're in your 30s, 40s, you can use your children as a sort of bonding tool, right? Um, where that makes you trustable for other people with families and you will be, uh, the people will start talking to you just based on the fact that you have children. And if you don't, mm. then you're kind of excluded from that, right? There's this entire world of, of the younger and, and middle uh, families that you, you're simply not included in. You're not a part of that club. That's true. So yeah. there's, uh, it, it's like it's sort of double whammy for the, uh, for the wall. We need a new conversation about motherhood, but how does she uh, approach the thoughts of her own future? Is she any closer to an answer to whether or not she will become a childless woman? Talking about whether I've made a choice or a decision is something I will deliberately avoid. There is an expectation in society that we can choose ourselves a, to a happy life, and that the perfect and important thing in life is to have a family. Now, I take issue with this because I do believe, I mean, of course, we, I think we can all agree that, you know, we, we are all dealt various different cards in life, but ultimately what we choose to do with those cards, you know, <laughs> decide how we end up to a certain extent. There are ceilings. Uh, and there are floors, uh, depending on where and when you live. So, yes, the point is that you do choose to have children if that's important to you. Like it's it's not. It's actually quite easy to choose to have children. It's one of the easiest choices to make, really, especially when you're young. So much so that people, you know, quote unquote, accidentally chooses it all the time. And uh, I don't really understand what you're trying to get at miss <laughs> i mean to be honest uh, it just seems like poor self-reflection in my view if you're sort of if you're 40 years old and you you don't know if you want to do something yet then you probably don't want to do it right i mean probably. yeah th there's a revealed preference there right how much time point, you actually, why not just yeah. say i don't want to do it <laughs> yeah I mean, there's uh, you know i mean how how would you not know if you haven't had the desire to do so and you haven't spent any time thinking about it then obviously that's not an attractive prospect it's like uh, well, you know I, I had like a childhood dream about being a video game designer or something but now that i'm in my 30s i look at how much time i've actually spent trying to do active video game design or programming or something well it's, it's very close to zero it's, it's not exactly zero but the, it, it, with me it's just honestly it just means that i don't want to do that enough i just don't you know, it's not going to happen because I'm not putting any time into it. And I think that should be enlightening for people just paying attention to how much time they're spending on something to see if it's actually important to them and not whether they have some abstract idea about what they should or shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a bit weird to sort of hear these musings from this woman. Uh, I think Nordanon in the chat had an interesting comment about this. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, women who say this always have the dullest lives, all that quote unquote freedom and independence, and what have they done with it? Uh, lounging about consuming garbage on TV. Yes. I mean, I'm seeing this also with the TikTokers, these sort of like uh, childless couple TikTokers. They talk about their, their lives, and I mean, they, they live just like families with young kids. They don't do shit, really. They just kind of, okay, we go to Costco and buy extra marshmallows or something like I mean, yeah, if you, you have all the this, same this, life, uh, you just don't have the happiness of a child. If you, if you have <laughs> uh, if you have all this freedom, you could engage in, let's say, other lifestyles. And I don't just mean sexually, but uh, let's say that like, you wanted to do extreme tourism, for example, or something. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to go and like check out war zones or, or uh, 
look at like weird um you know places around the world or something or get into things that could have potentially be slightly dangerous or or exciting in other ways that you could engage in because you're not tied to uh, a child and you have so much energy and time and, and resources on your hands that you could have do something very exceptional but they very typically i'd say probably more than nine out of ten times don't they just do what you know boring families do with just without the kids yeah a lot of the time it, it looks like that uh there's a paragraph more but it's really nothing nothing more that was some of the red meat for the week as it were um how do you want to segue into the next one bloody path no, I think we could uh, maybe yeah, maybe take a look at the documentary thing yep. because that that was an interesting. I mean, I don't know if we mentioned this previously, but you were in fact contacted by a person from the NRK, that is the Norwegian State Broadcasting Television, to get an interview as to whether they would have you on for a documentary about right wing extremism in Norway. In fact. And well, uh, uh, I'm going to be clear. I was I talked to someone on their research team, um, and uh, it wasn't really like an interview whether or not I should be included. Um, of course, I'm sure if I had said that I wanted to appear, they would have accepted me. But uh, uh, I mean, I quite clearly <laughs> didn't want to. I think you made um, the I'll, right choice, honestly. Um, I mean, the reason I told them that I didn't want to appear on this, as far as I remember it, right, is that I told the woman, who the researcher that I was talking to, that I believe that I can um, uh, explain, first of all, the things that we talk about on this show, the philosophical and political things that I think about that I read about uh, are quite difficult to parse. They require time. It's a bit of an intellectual journey. If you're interested in this, you would have found your way here uh, and you're listening to the show right now. And if you're not, you won't understand what I'm saying. So just in, in terms of a pure platform, I have nothing to gain going on state media and talking to some random guy. Some boomer is going to listen to me talk about, you know, uh, monarchism or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, there's just nothing right number two while i believe that i can have a sensible conversation and present myself in a proper manner i cannot trust either them to cut me in a way where i'm you know allowed to be fully understood uh or even if they do i'm going to be sort of cut next to some weird skinhead in a forest doing doing you know krav maga or something and i don't want to do that so, you know, uh, number four, I, there's nothing, there's nothing in this for me, uh, and you might be a fed, I guess, <laughs> but I, I never said that. <laughs> um, so uh, I said I, I was more than happy to have like a two-hour conversation with her, just you know, talk about the show, talk about uh, just we talked some politics, we talked some philosophy. Uh, I tried to explain some the ideas about you know. Um, the Spenglerianisms and the uh, great chain of being, etc., and 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 how a lot of people seem to believe that we are heading into sort of dark times uh, and and the sort of the wheel of civilization, um, and how you can sort of mesh that with living an everyday life, uh, and and how you do that, and it's quite difficult. But uh, if you can parse sort of philosophy, the philosophy and the everyday problems on two different levels, it's 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 quite doable to to quote unquote ride the tiger, as it were. Um, so so it was pretty much an, a very innocent uh, conversation in that sense. Uh, and now that the documentary is out, uh, I'm very happy that I <laughs> appear on it uh, because it is literally what I said was going to happen. It's you know. Uh, warrior spirit uh, you know credit where credit is due warrior spirit type guys you know doing mma in the forest talking about the 14 words and 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 uh, and throwing out some roman salutes right yeah uh i think that you you probably told me you had this talk with the woman it's, it's maybe been six months ago now and i 
think that you know our impression was that, that she would never make the documentary because nobody wanted to cooperate it's been she said i think that it was difficult to find people who wanted to show up there like most people had the same reactions that you had and simply said that i'm not showing up i think very few people believe in media neutrality or believe in state broadcasting channels as neutral institutions at this point and if you haven't learned that lesson there's something wrong but uh, of course you have some of the more kind of fringe elements uh, it's interesting because um the documentary is here now and you get to see some of the people involved and i mean one of the things that is cool about it is that we've talked about i think it's one of the first streams we did on like the state of right-wing politics in scandi countries we talked about the the politics of finland for example and like the the, the black and blue party uh, they made an appearance on this documentary we talked about uh, uh, i don't know if we talked about white boy summer festival uh, it was also something that was discussed here um and um, I think Burkhal mentioned this at some point, um, but he might have mentioned this uh, just in a chat and not on the longhouse. He said, yeah, there are some guys, you know, hanging out in the woods with like neo-Nazi uh, metal bands. Um, but uh, um, let's see here. Uh, just to um, let's some someone said something I wanted to highlight one moment. Um, Yeah, I'm not. I'm sorry, I, I I lost the comment. If, if there was one, um, yes, no. This this is what I was gonna say. I was gonna. The reason that she probably contacted me, by the way, is one of the only women we've had on the show. If you recall the women stream we did like a year ago or something, a year and a half ago, uh, we had Miss Scandy, I think was her name on, and she was connected to this sort of like Twitter sphere of young, uh. Nordic people who you know they they have like snufkin uh, avatars um, or, or they put like pine trees in their bio and stuff like that which I guess is code for some stuff and uh, I interacted with those people briefly uh, just to see if it was you know anything and I quite quickly concluded that these people are mostly just angry lonely people and um, they would in theory, adjust if they ever, you know, got a girlfriend. Pretty much, <laughs> um, they were more interested in sort of posting posting windmills than actually having political uh, discussions or sensible discussions or discussions about how society could change over time. Yeah, now, but these I, aren't the people necessarily in this documentary. The people in this documentary seem to be a bit more meat space, a bit more we want to organize and. Uh, feel a bit more threatened, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, the, the theme, I guess, was to try to expose the intersection between online and offline extremism, right? So some of these people will just not fit. If you're just sitting on Twitter posting windmills and uh, like making windmill macaroni or something, it's maybe a bit scary to some people, but it's quite innocuous. And she came on the stream where we were... Um, <laughs> we were like discussing who would you do if like uh georgia maloney or yeah, that's Nicki, true. Nicki minaj <laughs> or something yeah. and, and, and other right-wing <laughs> topics that uh you know dangerous extremist stuff fair enough that yeah. uh that, that we were doing but yeah back to the documentary so i mean what was interesting because we've talked about this as well like trying to find you know who is actually active in scandinavia and I mean, it's similar to our observations. Like the Norwegian scene is like almost nothing, right? It's uh, it's just kind of a blip. It's just a few people who are active. This is one of the things they talked about, like the active clubs and people who engage in what they yeah. call sort of like self-help nationalism. Like that was the first episode. The um, they they name dropped the golden one among other people as a sort of uh, premier influencer inside of that category of like. You know, uh, you're trying to you work out and you you eat a ketogenic diet and you do you do some Roman salutes and that kind of um, and read <laughs> Uh And of course, they had like they brought in a guy, some 
some dude who just wanted to talk about his like eggs and oatmeal diet or something. That was like the first episode. It wasn't particularly I, I think interesting. that uh, he talked about that and he didn't a lot of the thing that sort of seems to have been a recurring issue with this documentary is that the people who have been willing to step forward in front of the camera here uh, have a tendency to shut down when pressed on their beliefs. They're not able to basically roll with the punches of a dialogue when it comes to this. Um, but that just that might just be the editing. Uh, but considering how many times the um, what's the what's the host the the woman who who goes around and, and talks to these people sort of mentions that you know they just sort of shut down. The only time where she really has any sort of lengthy conversation is when she's talking to. Uh, two guys from this like neo-Nazi um, Finnish black metal group, uh, some older guys who are willing to basically talk to her for, for more than 10 minutes. Um, and even then it sort of devolves quite quickly. And, and I'm not sure if it's her or if it's them or it's just, I don't know. There's there's not really no conversation being had. Well, you, you, you mentioned uh, previously that, I mean, if she would wanted to dig more out of them, the strategy to use is to actually read up on the lingo and try to actually look at the intersection between what you'd consider moderate political uh you know right positions or right-wing positions and the, the positions that they have and try to use that to kind of pry out the more extreme points i mean i'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate here but she was basically running hatchling tactics that's what she seems to like the how she would do the interview uh, process. It's like, well, they, they would sit and talk. Uh, you know, we we stand in the ski masks and say that we well, we're we're going to prepare for the race war and we're going to deport uh, everyone and blah 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 and like and she would be like, well, why is it important to have a culture? Like, why is it important <laughs> to preserve the race? Uh, and it's it seems that she's and, trying some sort of uh, thoroughisms, but uh, she's not really able to ask the right questions, so it just kind of falls apart. Well, it, it's it is this kind of question that it's uh, they would just say that well, you should just soul search or something, or like why would you even ask that question? And I, I mean, if I was asked that question, I would just ask her if she would be willing to go up to like a Sami person, for example, in uh, in one of these protests in one of these kind of uh, quote unquote indigenous days and just ask uh, a person of sami ethnicity why is it so important for you to be sami and can't you just like ditch this entire yeah, project why, why can't because the people of gaza just join israel yeah exactly i mean why is your identity as a palestinian so important right why i mean you're just an individual like we're just individuals there's no need to talk about your uh, serbian identity or your croatian identity or, or <laughs> anything i mean you would never ask that it's it's only people of um Let's say like standard what you'd consider you know quote unquote white people whether it's uh, anglo-saxons northern europeans you know like white americans of german descent people like this who would be asked why it's important to have a, a sense of identity ethnically racially religiously and so on like they, they it, it's just taken for granted if you're touching on some kind of brown victim group that you would never ask this, uh, you would never ask them this question, and you'd be looked at weirdly, or, or you even be disapproved of within your own groups. And I, th I think that's why, like, maybe you could do that in the '90s, ask people why it's like so important to to preserve your your peoples or whatever. But um, it, it's just kind of you're not going to get any good answers. There's not going to be any good dialogue coming from that. So th it was a bit lackluster in terms of like trying to understand their viewpoints, but. On the other side, she gave these people a surprising amount of time to talk uninterrupted. Yeah. Uh, this was quite new, and this is something to think about because there's, um, I mean, we talk about the idea of woke being rolled back, and like the the media and the, the like, the deep state, um, or whatever you want to call it, the establishment complex, only escalating their rhetoric and escalating the hostilities. And I mean, I saw this as basically something different. This is really more of the establishment rolling back the aggression in order to get these people to provide what they want. Like they want people to, they want to make this documentary, this kind of entertainment product that's like edutainment 
whatever you want to call it uh, about right-wing extremism but if you're going to make that you need actual right-wing extremists to show up there uh, so you had to make certain concessions and if that's just allowing them to talk maybe uninterrupted for two minutes then they had to do that right and, and i don't think that if this was made in like say the early 2000s it would have been a lot more aggressive uh, or, or in terms of like clipping or, or how the you know the terms that these people would have been able to come on but of course that would have been reflected by the fact that i think more people would have just showed up you know they would have had maybe a line of people showing up uh, wanting to talk about their you know military jackboots and wife beat <laughs> wife beaters and swastika tattoos and so on uh, do you agree yeah i i, I see where you're what you're getting at um so but but that's something you and i discussed a lot as well which sort of like what was the point of all this what was the point of platforming these people to the degree they did when to my eyes a lot of them come across uh they come across as people unfavorably but i think a lot of people will listen to what they're saying and say hang on a moment this isn't that crazy right oh yeah absolutely and and like the the main points that they would come up with would not be that crazy at all so it's sort of i guess it's lucky for the producers that these people also had spinning windmills and and all this kind of like uh you know the swastika flag yeah i mean if they, on their fridges. They, would, they would probably sell lots and get a lot more votes right yeah exactly so it, it's i mean that that's one of the things i was thinking about here really the strength of the sensible centrist concept and kind of framing yourself as a centrist when talking about these things because they kept wanting to nail people down to ideology right that's what was going to be the final thing here is that okay please talk about your ideology what what does your ideology mean and um you know what about the his history of this ideology and like it is just such it is baggage really that's what ideology is and trying to say that because you want to talk about remigration history ethnicity uh, rights and so on then you have to also wear a uh, uniform goose step throw roman salutes and do historical revisionism like it's all unnecessary to sit and have these discussions i mean you can have the opinions that you like but you're just kind of dragging down the discussion by having to carry this baggage around with you that's just going to make people have this kind of like gut disgust can, reaction yeah. easily have these opinions without all of that other stuff right yeah exactly you, you, and you, you, uh, you can say that hang on a moment you, you can make the argument in a political sense that is something like remigration something we should consider is it an option without having the spinning windmills you know on your on your shoulder right or on your uh having like a lapel right uh it's it's very nordan says ludic discovers the concept of optics but it's more than just that um because in my research conversation the the woman i talked to was very interested in knowing what books I've read or what books I referred to. She was very interested in whenever I broached the subject of any ideology, uh, sort of trying to find something to basically pin me on. And the weird thing is, I think I told her that, but maybe I'm just misremembering, is that, you know, if you want to know what books I'm building on, they're all here. If you listen to The Longhouse, I've mentioned them multiple times, right? Yeah, they want to hear Mein Kampf, right? That's uh, and you're not that's gonna kind of what they're fishing you. for, not um, anything else. I mean, yeah, Nordan on had this com com comment here about optics. Um, I mean, I'm just saying that there's like, there's just I can't imagine a single political conversation where it's an advantage to bring up ideology. Like after watching, there's not a single one where even if you're on the left, where saying that you know I'm a democratic socialist or something like this is a benefit to you because regardless you end up just kind of either your ideology is that it sounds like this kind of like niche cuckoo stuff that just is terminally online or it is something that's been tried in the real world and has failed and you have to carry the baggage and be questioned about that and pinned along those lines so yeah the framing is always the the centrist common sense position let's see here we got uh 
Bert Green is the front here for two uh, euros. Says they watch us to take notes how to deal with us. Well, that might be, but I, I'm not saying this as sort of necessarily a white pill. I got the impression that, um, we were uninteresting to this project. <laughs> uh, when all was said and done. Uh, well, they, we'll apparently see. they they didn't watch us because. Um... I mean, if they did, they could have asked other questions. I think they just sort of gave up. Uh, my impression, they gave up after maybe two episodes or something, trying to get something good out of it. Uh, and, and that is and They didn't also watch another, the four-hour uh, gargle stream. That's where all the extremism is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you missed out. You need, uh, you need some more kind of dedicated, these kind of more uh, psychotic uh, left-wing types, right, to, to show up and uh, actually sit and do like an hour marathons to just sort of fish out every N-word and every inference to some mid-century German ideology. And you spot the sun and rads, basically. <laughs> I mean, that was yeah, an interesting it. part of the documentary as well. It's a sort of introductory course, I guess, to normies to sort of spot right-wing symbolism there. The, you know, and you don't need, you don't need to have uh, these right-wing people in there for that. You can just do these sort of presentations and they have some kind of trip-hop music in the background. They talked about you know this is the like the Sonnenrad and the Totenkopf, um, the, all these kind of like weird SS stuff that they're putting in little Dark Age compilations. But I mean, speaking of there, I don't know if you want to bring up the, uh, the the Ram Ranch guy because they, you know, I I, yeah, he, I, I put he gets um, rolled out every time these days when because he's like Norway's number one expert on incels or whatever. Um. I had to Google here. him. Let's see if you can just get the picture up because yeah. this is the the guy they bring in as the the expert on accelerationism, which is something that they they talked about. They talked about it because they talked to a person who defined themselves as an accelerationist and um, uh, another person who got a, a terrorist, uh, Philip Mousehaus, um, defined himself as an accelerationist as well. Yes, uh, for some reason, this guy had a Ram Ranch t-shirt on national TV talking about accelerationism. I'm, I'm not sure why. I have yeah, no this idea is our uh, super serious kind of uh, journalist here who, I mean, but if, if there is someone who's like watching every episode of this show, it's him. Probably so high if you're watching Lasse. Um, I mean, I because I looked at his... Um, google search results and he writes for more and blah that is it, it's i mean it is kind of a cesspit for people like this these kind of like president sunday styled leftists who just want to dox people and if you doubt me look at his twitter timeline i think i linked it to you on telegram because he he's like putting forward like the the stone toss docs that's been done newly like he's apparently internationally involved and just like yeah everybody who's um Who's to the left of uh no, who's to the right of like Joe Biden has to have their information spilled, you know, and they, they can't stop talking about uh your kind of like right wing extremist bogeyman. You can kind of see it in his face. He looks he looks chronically tired from <laughs> he looks spot, very uh, done. Yeah. Spot sun and rads everywhere. This is a yeah. man who spent hours on 4chan arguing with like an 18 year old about accelerationism or something. Yeah, and he can't even read Wikipedia. I mean, even the uh, the wiki stuff will explain to you like where accelerationism comes from. He says that it's a sort of exclusionary kind of right wing uh, racialist concept when it's actually really sort of an anti capitalist notion from Nick Land, and you have a lot of leftist accelerationists as well. But yeah, it, they, these people don't care about trying to present anything evenly. They just want to sort of hunt down the uh, the 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 Nazis. Leo Borealis says that's some hardcore Coomer physiognomy right there. Yeah, this guy goons <laughs> clearly does. Uh, um, I do we have anything more we want to talk about this? Um, I went into this thinking that uh, it was gonna be just like a freak show, but I ended up actually feeling by the end of the documentary, I felt kind of let down because I felt like it was a wasted opportunity on the part of like they got really close to a lot of people who believe quite hardcore things and they weren't able to basically engage with them on their own terms which I find annoying well um I mean 
you know, because I've not really been exposed that much. I'm I'm very much online talking to people in these spheres. So you don't meet these people who show up in, in meat space, quote unquote, to do yes. be a part of these active clubs, as I said, uh, to do MMA and stuff. I mean, I could probably get it be nice for me to get in shape at some point, but I've had little contact with them. And it's it's sort of interesting that I feel like they they seem very unaffected by the stuff that's going on in our spheres as well. They do not seem to be, you know, they are like these kind of standard soldier archetypal people who are not academically inclined and they think in terms of, you know, good for them. in that sense, um, as I said, it, credit where credit is due. These are, you know, sort of warrior spirit people and try as I might, I probably don't have that in me. I am an academic at the end of the day. Right. Yeah, I mean, you you really notice with these people, but you need people like this, and I'm, I don't just mean in our spaces, but like even the regime, quote unquote, just in uh, society needs, in general, yeah. you just need to have people like this. I mean, the people who are actually willing to die in the trenches if you get invaded, these will be I mean, like one first of the in guys line in to Finland, yeah. The MMA thing had literally come back from fighting in Ukraine. Yes. Now, I don't know which side, probably on the west side, right? Uh, if, you, yeah, if you're Finnish neo-nazi i think you're going to be on the ukrainian side Probably, just guessing yeah. but um uh, uh but I, I mean i made the joke to you that like they're going to use this docu like putin is going to use this documentary as justification to invade the the, the ukraine to, to kind of denazify a white boy it's summer denazify finland now, yeah um, it seems to be it seems to be necessary um but uh i mean with these people like they have the they're still going on this kind of standard wig nat, like the 1488, the 14 David Lane, 14 words. Uh, they, they do the windmills and the, the Roman salutes, and they, like, they talk about the race war, right? So they're kind of stuck in the 90s. Honestly, they, it's, it's not moved on a whole lot but from that's there. That's what's kind of interesting. It's, it's like the skinhead movement, so to speak, were more or less, in Norway I'd, especially, I'd say, were sort of snuffed out in the 90s, right? Um but but then it sort of just hasn't moved on from there so when it gets revitalized or revived in any form it just continues from where it left off yeah um, i i understand enjoying like the aesthetic of um national socialist black metal i mean we've had black metal enjoyer on the show and i, I mean there's an international kind of fanfare around this stuff and yeah i mean more power to them but the they they, they keep harping on this idea about the the race war in a sense, like it, it's something that if you're a completely kind of uneducated person, this seems like something that could be plausible. You know, there's going to be at some point, like society is just going to break out into a race war. You know, it's it's not not just confrontations or anim general animosity or that it's going to be ethnic tensions. There's going to be like an actual war full stop. But it, it just seems to be a kind of misunderstanding as to how wars actually work and the fact that these things have to be organized from the for top down, you need to have for that actual yeah. Yeah, actual leadership to things and, and like sovereigns who, who actually will declare this. There's going to be rules, there's going to be terms and actual goals to this stuff. It's not just going to be, okay, at this point, every like person on this side of the color spectrum is going to try to kill every other person on that side. Like, it's yeah, just like never, that's just never going to happen. Thing. No, I yeah, mean, before it, that happens, you're going to have an economic decline that's going to do a whole bunch of other things before you get to that point anyway. So I, I don't think you ever will. I mean, even though there's going to no, be I'm animosity. Saying, if, and, if you were to sort of map it out, right? Yeah. Uh, and you get animosities, you get people who will get to wise, they'll, you know, throw rocks at each other. And But this, you, you're never going to have war as conventionally understood between races unless these races are actually led formally like there's there has to be some kind of structure around this so it's it's like okay they're waiting for this to happen it never will happen because that's just not how wars in general function right and and i mean if they're reading history it, it should be simple I, it, it's not something that should have to be explained but they seem to just be going on and on about this stuff so i felt like it was worth uh talking about yeah no, certainly. And given, you know, personal history with this, it's, it was interesting to see the result, if nothing else. Um, and if nothing else, I feel justified in having a clear and hard stance that I'm not going to be a part of whatever this is going to be. 
I think uh, I think you could have probably made a very good interview. Uh, probably, probably could, I mean, but that's the point. The, the, I mean, yeah. I would be in. You pick any one of these four episodes, and there are weirdos in them, right? And I would be in the same episode as some kind of weirdo, right? I wouldn't be getting an episode for my on my own. Yeah, I'm wondering where they would put you actually uh, in these categories. Maybe they would have to reframe the entire thing or something. I mean, th there was like you know they had a guy or a representative from the Norway Democrats show up and talk about politics. And um, it was instructive because I felt like he did really well uh, in terms of just avoiding. And then all his friends bullied him in front of the camera for all to see. So that was fun. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, but uh, it, it's really sort of the, uh, particularly when it comes to like a political formula for the, the populist right or, or like kind of the right wing in Europe, it, it is going to be, like something you're seeing in the Netherlands now with the Gert Wilders anti-Muslim uh, party or something that it, it's really about sort of culture and heritage more than it is about some kind of like splitting people into uh, anthropological racial groups or something like this. And then that, uh, you know, the culture in a sense will be a proxy for the race, but <laughs> you're very much not likely to succeed in politics running on kind of anthropological or sort of genetic mm. race or what they call uh, the, the you know biorealism I, uh, there is an article on praxarchy it, it was published uh, quite a while ago by charlemagne who explains this kind of stuff that uh, you have i don't know what they call themselves online the uh, biorealist or is sort of um, they, they have some sort of other term the people who talk about iq all the time like this is uh, of course interesting but it's just not something that's actually implementable in any realistic political platform as like you can be able to go out and sort of speak to people about uh you know this kind of bio reality things it's 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 just not feasible it has to be along the lines of a sort of culture or some type of yeah. uh religion ideal ethnic groups uh like this uh anything anything that goes into that kind of like aut autism side of science it's it's not for politics it's just it needs a completely different language to it and uh, he he was very good at that not falling into it sort of being baited into talking about both the spinning windmills and the uh, kind of biorealism human biodiversity anon says yeah hbd that's yeah. the uh H hbd crowd if, exactly if that. you it's go to uh praxarchy you can search for charlemagne and it's one of his uh, recent articles there Uh, you can read read about that. Um, okay, should we move on? Is there anything else? Yeah, oh, I, hang think, on. I think Scrooge we've says said, uh... um, says the man with a whale wearing a Viking helmet, uh, not a weirdo at all. Well, <laughs> I'm surprised they have to keep telling people this that I don't actually. I'm. This isn't what I actually look like. <laughs> this is just an animal uh... avatar. I've sorry, met him in real life. I can I you. can yeah. confirm you don't look like that uh, IRL. Um, I would be able to, you know, if nothing else, present myself as a regular person, um, in front of the camera. Okay. Uh, what about Jared Taylor then? Says Nordan on. Um, his style and presentation makes it more palatable. He he is as palatable as you can get with something like that, but it's still not something you can turn into an actual political uh, populist platform. I've yet to see it happen anywhere. I don't. Um, I don't. I really do not see it um, as as something that you can give people that will give them any kind of optimism or or uh, in, inspire people. All right, moving on to our final topic for tonight, um, which is an article from The Telegraph that says, the world's population set to fall for the first time since the Black Death. Global fertility rates hits an historic tipping point and are unlikely to recover, experts say. By Michael Searles, health correspondent. Uh, the world population is expected to fall for the first time since the Black Death because of plummeting birth rates, a Lancet study has found. The decline in the number of children women are having has started to slow the growth of the global population, which stands at just over 8 billion. By the way, I've claimed this since the start of the Longhouse, um, based on, what's his name, the Swedish uh, statistician for a long time. Hans Rosling? to be right. Hans Rosling, yes. 
Um, although he has, uh, uh, he has a lot of other sort of baggage in, in that, uh, in his conclusions, but at least the data and the science behind it uh, seems to be solid. It would be the first time that the number of people on the planet has decreased since the Black Death bubonic, bubonic plague pandemic killed as many as 50 million people in the mid 1300s, including up to a third of the population in Europe. That is the only time to date that the number of humans on Earth has fallen, with historians estimating that the global population fell from around 400 to 350 million. Women are required to have 2.1 children each on average to maintain a population growth. This is known as the total fertility rate, and as of 2021, it stood at 2.2, uh, sorry, 2.23 worldwide. Experts say it's a persistently downward trend, Having fallen from 4.84 in 1950, Jesus, that's a quick diff. <laughs> uh, to be fair, the post-war was the baby boom. Researchers predict it will in decrease to uh, 1.83 in 2050 and 159 by 2100. This means that in 2050, 155 out of 204 countries will have birth rates lower than required to sustain the population size. This is... Uh, you know, long-term-wise, uh, quite uh, worrying, not necessarily uh, worrying in the sense that, you know, everything's going to go to shit. It's it's painting the picture uh, of a bit of a slow decline. Um, yeah, I mean, like it's... You, you, could, you, could, you could almost imagine it as being like an Englishman uh, right after the Romans kind of just fucked off and told you you're going to have to maintain Hadrian's Wall by yourself now. Right. It's like, what do we do? We don't know how to do any of this. Right. Um uh, that's it look kind of looks like that's what we're going into. I'm always cautious about these people who predict one hundred years into the future. To be fair, you know, yeah. there's a it's, lot of uh, weird stuff quite... that uh tends to happen that you can't account mm -hmm. for. So I'm I'm generally just you know, oh in, in the you know, in the hundred years it's gonna be like this if we continue to like shut up, you know, you don't know that. Uh I mean, things no, can take a lot of dramatic It's purely, things. you know, if this continues in the same way it has been going for the past, you know, 20 years, it's going to be, it's going to be like this in 100 years, which you never know is going to be true, right? There might have, there might be things that are greater, there might be things that are worse that happens in between. Um, there might be another, you know, a worse pandemic, right? Uh, that, uh, or a similar pandemic to the like that that kills a bunch of people and then the fertility rates shoot up again in a hundred years right yeah or a, a war breaks out i mean it already does in a lot of places uh, a lot of people die and then the people who remain uh, with the mortality salience and the reinvigoration will you know uh, raise the fertility rates again or they maybe they just have to because the technology has been blown out so much that they can't maintain their sort of comfy industrialized lifestyles anymore So it's by no means a given, uh, but this is what the prediction is, at least. By 2100, there will be 198 countries, or 97% of the world by population, and countries in sub-Saharan Africa will account for more than one in every two babies born. In 13 countries, so uh, Africa superpower by 2100, I guess. In 13 countries, including South Korea, Bosnia, and Herze Herzegovina, in Bhutan, women will have less than one child each on average. It's wild how South Korea has reached this point before like anyone else, <laughs> considering how, how in, in a sense, young that country is culturally right now. I've joked with just... my wife that they're like speed running. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, they're just trying to get to the end before anyone else. I mean, uh, we should maybe bring dissident nomad back to sit and explain this stuff to us because he's that been be there right yeah. um um i just he's just nomad now sorry the the artist formerly known as dissident nomad oh really okay um yeah. that but he has been working in south korea so if he has some first-hand experience explaining like how it's possible to go that quickly into a 0.8 fertility rate i mean it's just insane yeah it is um, the UK, like other high-income countries, has a fertility rate low, lower than the average, at just 1.49. So the UK is already at the uh, 2100 mark. 
This has fallen from 2.19 in 1950 and will continue to decrease to 1.38 and 1.30 in the next 25 and 75 years, researchers says. This will be, uh, excuse me, this will mean that the current population of around 67 million becomes increasingly unbalanced toward older generations before falling as the eldest people die, unless there is migration. Britain's, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Britain's falling birth rates are already playing out in real time, with recent data showing primary and secondary schools seeing fewer pupils apply for spaces that were once coveted. Women are increasingly turning to egg freezing, which has recently been in the spotlight with health leaders calling on fertility clinics to make clear the chances of la uh, chances of success. Last week, Miriam Cates toward Is it just me, or is this... Maybe this is just the way Brits write their articles. I feel like the grammar here is kind of weird. So this wasn't the translation or anything? It's the No, this uh, is, the, this is straight up the article from Telegraph.co.uk, I think. Uh, last week, Miriam Cates, Tory MP, said women should not be leaving it so late, so late, leaving it so late to have children and were being exploited by the false promise that egg freezing would work. Experts have said that the implications of a falling population for society will be immense as the old outnumber the young and increase pressure on health services and the workforce. By 2100, just uh, what's the meme? Britain is just the NHS with a country attached to it or something. Uh, by 2100. Yeah, it's, Sorry, it's true, ahead. though. Um, I mean, there's some comments there. I don't know if you can bring up the one by Henrik, um, the, the, the most recent one. He says that urbanization is the main reason you, uh, this is true. Uh, I mean, I saw a graph over like Germany's fertility rates for like the last 200 years. And the trends that you see it that is that it goes from like 10 ch children per woman when they lived mostly agriculturally, and then it, they sort of urbanized, industrialized. So it goes down to about three. And then you get to like the, the 60s with the, uh, the, the contraceptives and feminism and, and this kind of uh, all this other bizarre stuff and then it hits about 1.5 ish and then it just kind of drops slowly from there that's the trends that i've seen is that the yeah the, the very big hit this is um, this, this is this is the the argument that rosling had 15 years ago is that you know when this is uh, regardless of what the, the data always produces that as standard of living increases the fertility rate decreases and then it just keeps going down right Yes, Ergo, I mean, with, overpopulation was never an issue, uh, according to him, right? With urbanization in particular, it's sort of like it's very it's difficult because of population density in the cities uh, to that have too. more kids. Yeah. It's also very difficult because of the economic incentives that change. Like in in you know, if you live on a farm, then like more kids is free labor, right? I mean, if you live in the city, I, then yeah. it's it's just a, a, an economic liability. It, you know, it's hard to get space for them. They, they they cost a lot of money and you can't just put them in the factory. Or especially if you live in like a modern economy, like you can't get them to program C sharp, you know, when they're four years old or something. So uh, it's um, it, it's just very difficult. And it's kind of like you have to have a trade off between quality of life and actually reproducing. It's a very unhealthy uh, style. And of course, there's yeah. the that that is the biggest impact the absolute like largest effect that you're seeing all around but i think like the the technology especially around like uh, contraceptives and uh, with, with some of like the women's liberation the uh the the sort of homosexuality and that kind of stuff it, it it is responsible to some degree but the absolute biggest thing is um urbanization yeah i, I, I can see that yeah um let's see here um by 2100, just 26 countries will have birth rates that outpace the number of people dying, with, quote, most of the world transitioning into natural population decline. There could also be an increase in immigration from countries where there's still a, quote, baby boom occurring to plug workforce shortages, which will need to be managed, the researchers add. But, um, I, I know, you know, I don't want to be too black but or, or anything like that, but why? Why is that the frame? Why is the frame... You know, we have to uphold this at no matter the cost. Well, I mean, to to do a bit of a devil's advocate here, because in our spheres, it's sort of like the the framing is that the you have the the line go up isms either, or they talk about well, we need to maintain the the boomer yeah. generation. 
but as exactly. a, as a leader of a country it's no, I a understand very that, like you know you're geo, yeah just geopolitically even if you go away from the line go up is and just kind of like from a geopolitics standpoint it, it's not a very attractive prospect to sit on the no, you're already the, on this sort of conveyor belt yeah. and you know you can't really jump off it now but I mean, I mean, having like the majority of your population be retirement age and just be like a sucking drain that just needs to needs medication and surgeries and who contribute nothing. I'm not I'm just going to say the Sam um, Hyde line, but uh, you probably know what I'm thinking of. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of apologizing to the audience that I haven't been diligent with doing the gaming streams, but I wanted to do like a stream where I play Caesar Tree. Um, and uh, because, I mean, it's it's a great game by like, the people who made like the Pharaoh series. It's a sort of city builder strategy game, but uh, it was made in the '90s. But it kind of has all of the you know all of, all of the Hans Rosling truth is kind of packed into that game, where you get like the game is sort of you get assignments as uh, a Roman governor to build cities, and you have certain goals about you know diplomacy. Uh, resources, uh, economical self-sufficiency. You want favor with like Caesar and the other, uh, like the larger heads of state, and you need to achieve this within a time frame because your population ages. And at some point, like when you built up your economy, you end up having too many old people who don't work in your cities, and then you can't build anymore. Like you just can't reach the goals if you haven't done it within a certain time. Then you're sort of screwed. That's like the game over condition in that game that your population is too old and then you just have to restart. So the game just says, well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, well, it doesn't say that. It just becomes impossible. Like you just keep trying to add, uh, you know, more factories and buildings and stuff. But, but there's just, there's people living there, but they aren't working. So you just can't get enough output to meet the goals required. Right. So there's like this kind of imbalance there. So from like a leadership perspective, you just look at the the health of the nation or the ability to defend or do anything uh, economically and or it's, strategically. It's possible, uh, right? And yeah. it's just not possible. So the alternative then is that you have to be dedicated to, to maintain a museum, in a sense, a museum of just sort of old people uh, stock. Or, or, or I mean, it's, it's either that or you're going to have to do the Sam Hyde thing. Which is why I suspect the uh, kind of normalization of the a uh, lot of these kind of made programs are um, popping up everywhere. Right. That's, fuck. That's dark. Yeah. No, well, but I, I understand. Yeah. Like that's that's I understand that to to you know the powers that be. That's that's pretty much the only way out, right? It's the we're just gonna you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Or they just you just cut them. You just have to cut the programs. That's yeah. uh, the, yeah. you know. The, I mean, I mean my, that's one, my one, one or the other, uh, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and yeah, already like say last week or something here in Norway, they they had to up the age of retirement, right, to be able to to sustain. Well, it's it's exactly those types of things that you have to do. It's it's either okay, we're we're cutting the entitlements and we're upping the age of retirement, and and I mean that's kind of why you know something that's sort of slightly blackpilled me on kind of the um, some of the populist movements in Europe. I, I wrote about this in in one of these chats that. Um, like you're seeing in France, you know, the, with with Emmanuel Macron, one of the reasons he's unpopular is because he kind of increased the retirement age in France, and the people want to turn to Le Pen. And like typically, you'd want to celebrate that. Oh yeah, the right wing populists are gaining steam, but they're gaining steam because like people just want to retire earlier. <laughs> it's just kind of oh, we want to retire earlier, and we don't want to told we don't want to be told that we need to have demographic rearmament or something. You know, it's just, it's just, yeah. The uh, the right wing is gaming, gaining steam for the wrong reasons entirely. You know, it, it's really kind of like the neo libs who are trying to just, okay, we can't make the immigration work, so let's try to cut entitlements and have more kids. And it's like, no, we're going to go to the populist because they promised we can get, uh, we can have yeah, our they, cake. We can get too, more yeah. yeah, the programs are going to stay up. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like at some point, there's going to be, you know. <laughs> not the day of the pillow as some people call it but there's gonna have to be a bit of a reckoning with the um older generation about like okay how at, at some point you're just sort of sucking the life or the potential life out of the rest of society really yeah i mean um, especially when they're getting really old as they're doing now you know they're just getting historically really really old and it's so expensive especially in the last years uh, of their lives just maintaining them at this point and like the, and, and that's going to be like the heavy the largest bulk of your population not just having them there they're going to be there voting yeah. they're going to be there expecting stuff 
Leo Boreal says the welfare yeah. state has to go. I mean, yeah, oh, yeah. in a sense, it, it does have to. Um, but I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be a, <laughs> it's going to be a fun time. Uh, Pergreen is to for another five euro. Thank you so much. Says, didn't old people sunset in ancient Scandinavia to lower the burden on the family? Yes, there's a, there's a long history of that. Um, in a, in a lot of cultures, I mean, um, Scandinavia did things, um, sort of sunset or just, you know, time to go out in the woods, you know, grandpa, uh, and never See, return. S Sweden are going to bring back the Midsommar, uh, horror film exactly. strategy of dealing uh, with old people. I know a lot of European nations do the same thing. I think some Asians do it. Uh, I'm not sure what the, if the Chinese do it. I know the Japanese used to do that thing. There's that famous uh, painting of the guy carrying his like elderly mother up the mountain, right? Um, so, so it's not something something new in that sense. Uh, although, of course, keeping the old people around as long as they are wise and uh, and uh, capable of love is certainly something we should aim for. Um, but uh, the problem is that at some point it just becomes unfortunately that's the thing we've put ourselves in the situation where this is going to become an economical problem at some point it's going to be a spreadsheet problem and then you know the made programs are going to roll out yeah i mean at this point i can scream as much as i like about the inhumanity of the made stuff but i, I can see the logic there you know uh i see the logic but yeah. it just sucks that we've sort of painted ourselves into this corner right <laughs> uh that's all so, Dr. Natalia Bata Batacharji, co-author of the study and lead research scientist at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, said that declining fertility rates will become will completely reconfigure the global economy and the international balance of power, and will necessitate reorganizing societies. That's sufficiently vague. Global recognition of the challenges around migration and global aid networks are going to be all the more critical when there's fierce competition for migrants to sustain economic growth. And as sub-Saharan Africa's baby boom continues at pace, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Professor Stein, uh, Stein Emil Volset, senior author from IHME, said the world was facing staggering social change throughout the 21st century. He said, in many ways, tumbling fertility rates are a success story, reflecting not only better, easily available contraception, but also many women choosing to delay or have fewer children, as well as more opportunities for education and employment. The researchers used key metrics, including women's education, use of contraception, child mortality, and urbanization to determine changing fertility rates. These predictions could be changed by local policies in world events like pandemics and wars. Well, I mean, certainly the last ones, but We've also talked a bit about uh, uh, fertility rates before, and local policies seems to not work in the long term. I, I feel like the WEF group missed the golden opportunity with the COVID-19 pandemic to depopulate, honestly. Uh, I'm a bit disappointed in the lack of depopulation. <laughs> right. But I mean, if Clark Schwab really uh, wanted yeah. to do the fourth industrial revolution, he would have taken out everyone's grandma. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, I mean, you had a disease that specifically targeted old people and they, they put in so much resources to keep grandma alive. Uh, now we have to deal with this problem. I mean, it's not now it's not just like a, it's not just an organic problem anymore. It's like an artificial problem that we've, mm, uh, na yeah. nature tried to correct for this. And uh, we, um, <laughs> we, we rolled out the wax. We, we kept uh, grandma alive yeah. and now we have to pay more money. Leo Borel says Klaus Schwab strongest soldier. <laughs> I think that's your Twitter bio. Now, yeah, that, that's it? my Twitter byline now. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, Professor Melinda Mills, director at the University of Oxford's Demographic Science Unit, said shrinking and aging populations demand preparedness and reorganization of societies. From impacted food security and migration patterns to the very infrastructures of countries, she said, population composition affects infrastructures such as schools, housing, transports, housing, and healthcare, pensions, but also cultural and voting changes. Not only that, I mean, I think the big one is infrastructure, but in a lot of ways that we're not really aware of, or sort of the waters that we're swimming in. It's not just sort of the bridges and the water supply, but a lot of the modern world is built on 
technology infrastructure that is very difficult to maintain and is being maintained by old people, uh, old the old guard, so to speak, who's keeping keeping all of the internets running pretty much, who's keeping all of the uh, communication services running. And uh, those guys disappearing is going to be rough. It, it already is. And uh, these jobs are not sexy, right? It, it's They're not, not like uh, you can't use JavaScript libraries to fix the uh, the electronics on the train lines. It, oh, or the banking. That the Germans the, put up in yeah. 1934. Yeah. It's uh, I said it's going to be a bit of a you know Englishman trying to repair Hadrian's Wall moment at some point, um, and that's it. That's the article. All right, um, I think that's all we had for today, um, and we actually managed to hit one and a half hours on the dot. That's pretty good. Perfect. Very nice. Uh, as usual, Ludic Path, is there anything you would like to shill before we get out of here? Yes, read praxarchy.com and have a good night, everybody. Praxarchy.com, of course. In the description down below is a link to my Twitter uh, if you want to engage with some of my sh more shit posting <laughs> these days. Uh, oh, uh, Leo Borealis sent me a link. Okay, we'll do we'll do this for five minutes. I, I opened the link, Leo. And I felt like this is probably an episode, uh, but I'll humor you for a moment. Um, so let's see here. Twitter. Share. From Jeremy Kaufman. Yale researcher Dan Cahan studied the personality and cultural differences of Americans and found a fascinating distinct cluster. White hierarchical individualistic men. Making up around one-sixth of the population, this cluster has markedly different views about risks, guns, environment, and more. For example, here's white hierarchical men on climate change versus everyone else. How much risk do you believe global warming poses to human health, safety, or prosperity? Then the white hierarchical individual male uh, sort of all distributes along the one, one and a half uh, zero being no risk at all, seven being very high risk. Everyone else clusters, both men and women are about four. Maybe uh, males who are non uh, hierarch individualist uh, are 3.5, 3.8. Um, hierarchical. So even, Ty are, even Tyrone is scared of. Uh, even Tyrone, Tyrone is scared of uh, yeah. global warming. Unless he's in, he's, uh, I'm not sure if this, uh, uh, if there's one for like black men, hierarchical individualist men just uh, don't just not overlap with everyone else on the risks of climate change. They're on a different planet, but hierarchical individualists aren't usually universally fearless people. Uh, they just have different risk assessments. For example, white hierarchical individualists find the idea of gun regulations to be incredibly high risk, but almost no one else do. Uh, does. Here's the full chart chart of risk perceptions. So, the red line is white hierarchical individual list, and the black line is everyone else. Uh, and left zero risk, no risk at all. Seven high risk. So they are so white individualist males are over indexing on gover government regulation of private business, on government restriction on private gun ownership. Uh, consumption of red meat, they don't see as a high risk. Uh, generally more against legalization of uh, marijuana, environmental regulations. Um, so there are a couple of cases where this is just sort of everyone clusters on risk going from around two to four, depending on what it is, right? But these uh, white hierarchical individualist males tend to bounce around a bit more to sort of the extreme ends on individual issues, well, it seems. I'd, I'd like to say it's based, but it's very kind of along the lines of they've got a 2A absolutist MAGA patriotard uh, line here. So, <laughs> well, it's all kind of baked into the cake if you're American, I guess. Maybe it is. Let's see here. Um... Cahan's fascinating research further solidifies that how many 
Um, is this a big? No, it's not a big threat. Uh, Ken's fascinating research further solidifies that differences in views of reality are fundamentally motivated by personality and value differences. Curious whether you're a hierarchical individualist or an egalitarian communist. Here's the test. I guess this is what Leo wanted us to do. Uh, this is too long. <laughs> this is this should next be part episode. Of an episode. Yeah, next we'll episode, next we'll time. do the cultural cognition worldview scales. We'll find out if we're, we'll use data and science to find out if we're based or not. <laughs> Nordana says hierarchical individualist is just a libertarian. Maybe, maybe. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching The Longhouse this week. We'll be back next week as usual, uh, even though it's uh, it's going to be, what's it called in English? Easter? Thursday? No, Easter. Yeah, it's it's yeah. Easter, but it's it's a specific day. I, I don't remember what it's called in English. Something about Palm. a meme. Jesus Christ! Hang on. Palm to Thursday or something. Uh, uh, I'm not sure to be honest what it what it is in in uh, in English. I know there's Black Friday. No, that's not Black Friday. What's it called? I googled Moundry Thursday. Okay, that's what they call it. Long, I think we call it Long Friday. Is that it? Yep. Because, of course, that was when the... Mm -hmm. You're saying something about a meme. Oh, oh, I understand. Oh, I see. I see now. That's the schizograph. All right, you'll, I'll, I'll post your meme. Good Friday. Is that it? Good Friday. Okay, but, but we're on Thursday, so I'm going to need the Thursday. So here's the... Here's the uh, um, here's the meme that Leo made. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Regarding we've this. set it up now, so you you can laugh with good conscience. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny in context. All right. Well, so next week uh, we will be uh, be back as usual, uh, and we'll probably do that. A cognition worldview test. Until then, I wish you a good weekend and a, a nice Easter if uh, if you're not going to be here next time. All right. Good night and goodbye.